To start off our discussion of Hartree-Fock theory, we're going to start by reviewing some concepts which we looked at in the quantum chemistry playlist, but in a little greater detail and more so just to make sure we're on the same footing for the foundations of what eventually leads us uh, to the full mathematical description of Hartree-Fock. So to start out with that, we're going to start with the molecular Hamiltonian again. So this is, as we remind ourselves, we are trying to get solutions to the time-independent, non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, h psi equals e psi. So just like in all of quantum mechanics, we're trying to solve the Schrodinger equation, which gives us the wave function of the molecule. So in this case, our particle or our system is always going to be some molecule, some collection of electrons and nuclei. And this H here, again, we'll remind ourselves is the Hamiltonian operator, which we discuss in more detail uh, later down here. And E is our molecular total energy. And of course, we say this is time independent because we're not including the time part of that. And we also say it's non-relativistic because we are not including the effects of relativity or things that happen when particles get close to the speed of light. Okay, so then we have uh, electrons in this system, there's going to be n of those. So typically n is going to indicate the number of electrons in our system. Oftentimes we'll use indices for electrons like i, j, and k, in which case those typically run from 1 to n. And we would indicate the position of a certain electron by saying ri, so that would be some position vector. And we're almost always going to be working in three-dimensional Cartesian space. So that would be xi, yi, zi. The x, y, and z components of that electron's position would represent its position vector. Then we're going to have nuclei as well, um, collections of protons and neutrons, which we are going to treat as kind of one uh, point particle. And they're going to be m of those. So if you see a, a capital M somewhere, that indicates usually the total number of nuclei. And there our indices are often going to be things like capital A, capital B, capital C, etc. So if I wanted to indicate the position of a nucleus, I would say its position vector, Ra, was its x, y, and z component of nucleus A. Okay, then we want to say, well, what's the, diff what's the distance between two particles? So if I have particle 1 and particle 2, then I'd have p position vector R12, which would just be the difference in each of those Cartesian dimensions, as any kind of vector subtraction would work. There's a vector for particle 1, a vector for particle 2, uh, subtract final minus initial, and that gives you uh, the vector from particle 1 to particle 2 x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, and z2 minus z1. Then also necessary in order for us to develop what this full Hamiltonian operator, this total energy operator is for our system, it's going to be uh, the Laplacian operator, del squared i, where here we've used del squared, the traditional Laplacian operator, but we've integrated a subscript i there, which we you know, might say to be represent which electron we're talking about. So that is the second partial derivative with respect to its x component, plus second partial derivative with respect to its y component, plus second partial derivative with respect to its z component. So the Laplacian for a given particle would be the sum of the second partial derivatives with respect to all of its Cartesian uh, components. All right, so if we think about all the types of particles that we might have here, if I have a little diagram on the right of two electrons and two nuclei. So I've indicated nucleus A, nucleus B, electron I, and electron J. So we'd in be interested in things like distance between two electrons, Rij, distance between two nuclei, Rab, and then there are four instances here of the distance between an electron and a nucleus. So we have RIA, RIB, RJA, and RJB. And typically the distances between all of these charged particles are going to be relevant because they're all going to contribute terms to our Hamiltonian operator. Our total energy is going to involve the attractions and repulsions between all of these pairs of charged particles. And of course, as I mentioned, all of them having their own x, y, and z coordinates that we can list out. 
Okay, so now getting into what the molecular Hamiltonian operator actually is. So if you are struggling to remember about the Hamiltonian or what that is, I recommend taking a look back into the quantum chemistry playlist, perhaps chapter three or chapter four. So we'll remind ourselves that the Hamiltonian operator is the total energy operator, which is composed of two parts. It's gonna be kinetic energy plus potential energy, kinetic energy T, potential energy V. And this kinetic energy is going to be the kinetic energy of all particles, so every electron and nucleus. And V is going to be the potential energy that results from all particle pairs interacting with one another. So if we consider there are four particles here, then every possible set of pairs between those four particles are these six interactions I have indicated in orange there. All right, so we can split that kinetic energy up in terms of nuclear and electron kinetic energy, two types of particles. And I can split up my potential energy into three terms as well. Uh, nuclear, nuclear repulsion. Nuclei have the same charge, they both repel each other, being positively charged. We have nuclear electron attraction, opposite charges attracting one another. And we have electron, electron repulsion, those two negative charges are going to repel one another as well. Okay, so if I break the, all those terms out into what they are, then I have, as I mentioned, overall particles. I have some overall nuclei, A equals one to M, number of nuclei. Of the kinetic energy operator for that particle, H bar squared, uh, Planck's constant over two pi quantity squared, uh, divided by two times the mass of the nucleus, times the Laplacian operator acting on the coordinates of that nucleus and that has a negative sign out in front. And then there's also a negative sign for the same term for all the electrons. Uh, electron I equals one up to N electrons. H bar squared over two times mass of the electron. Uh, Laplacian operator squared with respect to each electron. Then we take the three, uh, the three potential energy terms. We have the potential energy between all pairs of nuclei repelling one another. So that's a plus sign for a positive energy. Some A equals one to M, some B equals A plus one to M. So you'll notice that this is a pairwise sum. So what this means is if A is one, B starts at two and goes up. If A is three, B starts at four and goes up. If A is 100, then B is 101 and goes up to number of nuclei. What this does is get you all pairs of interacting nuclei. And then inside, that is determined by Coulomb's law, how strongly those nuclei repel one another. So we have ZA for the number of protons in nucleus A, ZB for the number of protons in nucleus B, times E squared, because each of those protons has a charge of plus E. So uh, ZA times E times ZB times E gives us this quantity. And then you have a denominator of four pi epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, divided by um, RAB, or the distance of how far apart these two nuclei are. Then we move on to uh, nuclear electron attraction. So that is a negative sign there, because that's an attraction or a decrease in potential energy. Sum over all nuclei, A equals one to M. Sum over all electrons, I equals one to N. In this diagram, both of those would be two, giving us those four interactions we see there. And that's uh, number of protons in nucleus A times E squared over four pi epsilon naught distance from the nucleus to each electron. So here the A is just an index. I'm not labeling that as a, as a particular nucleus, but just note that, uh, so this would be like nucleus one, nucleus two uh, for the value of A there. Okay, then lastly, we close it out with our electron-electron repulsion, the term that's going to cause us the most difficulty over this and uh, all other remaining chapters in this course, which we're going to be adding, because that's a, a repulsion increasing the energy. Sum I equals one to N, sum J equals I plus one to N, so that's all pairs of electrons that that is going to involve. Uh, e squared, so just charge of the electron, um, negative E times negative E gives us positive E squared, 
divided by 4 pi epsilon naught rij. So rij being the distance between electron i and electron j. In this diagram, there's only uh, two of those, so this would be a, a pretty quick sum to, to do. And then, of course, as I mentioned in the general case, Coulomb's law for these potential energy terms between our pairs of particles is going to be charge of particle 1 times charge of particle 2 divided by 4 pi naught or 4 pi epsilon naught r12, the distance between particle 1 and particle 2.